Met Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus looks at Peter and he says, Do you love me? And Peter says, Yes. And Jesus persists in saying, Feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Do the sheep work, Peter. Now, the reason for these questions is because Peter hadn't been doing the sheep work, you see. Just a few days earlier, Peter had denied the Christ, his relationship with the Christ, and that he didn't know him. So the idea of the questions was, my God, I can even use you, Peter, a sinner, to take up your work and feed my sheep. I believe the people in this county, Independence and Chapel Hill and Brenham, long time ago in the 1840s, they called out and they said they were hungry. And we're doing okay feeding our sheep and taking care of our people, but we need a pastor. And we need a little money. We need money for a church, and we need money for some help. Help the people of these counties, of this county, Washington County. And the Episcopal Church, and I want to be clear, the women of the Episcopal Church raise money to pull a missioner out here into the middle of Texas. I don't want to say nowhere because it was somewhere. But there wasn't much here. And it was hard living. And one of the first candidates for confirmation out of this congregation, raised up, was Lindsay Peter Rucker. Confirmed here. And later, raised up as a priest for the mission field in Texas. Ordained deacon in 1850 serving Chapel Hill and Brennan. In other words, we can only, we can serve our people and we can raise up our own pastors. It was a big moment for this church. Though, later that year, the crops failed. And the young congregation, we are told, dispersed. I think of Jesus on that hill saying, I see sheep without a sheep. And he was moved congregation dispersed, but they didn't go far. They went to Independence and Chapel Hill, so they were all right. (laughs) The Burton family, though, gave the land, which was sold for the first church. Elijah Downing transferred from Nacogdoches to begin work here, restarting the congregation, yet under the weight of another crop failure. Drought this time and a lack of funds, the congregation became small. And Downing resigned because he'd been working for two years without pay. In 1860, Daniel Shaver transferred from Waco again to take up the congregational work here with the people. The church struggled. To the end, the church, fires and sickness struck the congregation for eight years. You know what happened after that? Well, Mr. Rucker came back. He said, I love these sheep. I'll come back there and work with them in the fields of the Lord. And he was assigned a deacon. Now they were really concerned. They thought the town was going to die. But the railroad came. The railroad was good. The railroad was a good thing. Until they extended it to Austin. (laughs) And then the people of this county weren't too happy. 1867, they opened the door. said, Doss's council, we'll hold your council here. So all of our people. 40 representatives. (laughs) Now we number over 750. They repaired and enlarged the church. What I want to tell you is the Upshaws and the Millets, the Norses and the Newmans, with Bird, serving over 40 years. Together, they did the work. The truth is, we get all the glory when we put the collar on when you look back at history. But what I've learned over my 15 years as your bishop and five as canon is you're the people who do the work. 
It doesn't matter how good your priest is. You do the work. You're the big group. You be here when they come and you be here when they go. And that's life. That's the real life. We often use that passage of scripture to feed my sheep on ordination days. But no, <laughs> that's for you. That's Jesus asking you if you're willing to feed the sheep today, just like all of your faith ancestors have been feeding sheep all these years. I look across this room, I see a people of every generation here present. Jesus wants to know, do you love me? And will you feed my sheep right now? Because there are hungry people. And there's division and hurt and pain and suffering. There are hungry people and homeless people in Brenham and Washington County. And they need you. It is a good thing to celebrate 175 years of perseverance in this county. That's true. But do not be enamored with nostalgia. Because nostalgia is a terrible thing. Because you can't go back. For instance, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Now, you would have brought, we're big prayer book people, right? So you would have, we need the prayer books, but people brought their own prayer books. They didn't have prayer books for them to use, most likely, especially in the early days. They might have gotten a prayer book, but you see the problem with the prayer book was that that version of the prayer book, 1789 prayer book, was changed every three years. And so there were 25 different versions of that prayer book. So that means that everybody in this room had a different version of the prayer book. Now, every time we talk about changing the prayer book, I think, well, think about 1789. They went and changed it all the time. We seem to survive it, right? But we don't think about that. We don't think about the change that's needed when you're a missionary people trying to feed the people. You have to make adaptations. You have to be willing to change to meet what is in front of you. Now, I want to just consider me for a second. No, I wouldn't have that fancy staff. That wouldn't give it to the bishop until 1891. No ring, no cross. Uh, but I did grow this beard today for you so to reenact uh, what I would look like. Now, in the 1890s, uh, they also would have been doing morning prayer. So we would have had Eucharist once, well, just five times a year, maybe. And most people didn't show up because they were scared to take the Eucharist because they thought they might die. Now you think I'm joking about this, but so serious was the Eucharist that if you didn't come to the table sinless and repent of your sins right there, and then it was so important that, and you, I think Steve was doing a service, didn't he, 1789? Yes. He actually would have had to announce the service the week before so you wouldn't show up and get in trouble without getting your sins forgiven. The other thing was the sermon was at the end of the service. You didn't have to even stay for it. <laughs> Flags were not in the room at all. You could get rid of all those altars. The altar, we didn't call it an altar. We called it a table, and it was a table, and there was no altar. None of those candles. That's too many candles. <laughs> that all would be gone. That pretty red vesting of the chalice, that'd be gone. Everything, all that's gone. Just a little table there with a the symbol. And the, and the priest might stand in front of the table, might stand next to the table. I know y'all are eager. The sermon would have carried on, and I'm carrying on, but it would have carried on for another hour. And it probably was read from a book of sermons. So exciting stuff there in the Episcopal Church in that time. But it is a reminder that we can't go back. We can only go forward. And you and I only hold this gospel for a short while. We will affect two generations. And then our names will fade. And the most precious cargo here is not the boat. It's not the building. It's the love of Jesus that convinces you to feed God's sheep. It has always been that clear. And when we 
don't do it, we should ask for forgiveness so that we can try again. It's okay to fail. I fail. It's human nature. We avoid the word sin, but that is what it is. Sin is when we don't do the loving thing. When we don't see Christ in the other person. When we come to, as the, as the Book of Common Prayer says, when we come just to get our own stuff here, and then we go back out in the world and do nothing the rest of the week. The gospel is a seven-day-a-week deal. And the people then believed it. And I believe you believe it. But you might be a little afraid of it. Feeding sheep is hard work. And holding it up above everything else is even harder. It's even harder. The world will tell you this is the doctrine to follow. No, this is the doctrine to follow. You're that instrument blown around by every worldly thing. It comes from all sides. I don't think I'm talking to any group. We are all victims of it. And to proclaim the gospel and feed sheep today is counterculture. You all are called to carry this precious, precious message into the world as it has ever been. So celebrate 175th. Why not? You made it. You survived. You survived mold. Two boilers that overflowed. COVID. I mean, you know, right all about you. There was a congregation there in COVID. They didn't even go to church. Sit online. You don't even know what that is anymore. But you know that church is still there, they'll say. Still feeds the sheep. Because they love Jesus. Because they love Jesus. They may deny it, just like old Peter did, from time to time. But they confess, pick themselves up, start over. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.